the questioner says, I am from India. My doubt is whether it's mandatory for us who live in India to move to a Muslim country. And is it feasible for us to move to Pakistan? Then the general principle with regard to hijrah from a land to another land is that if you live in a land of kufr or shirk, meaning Darul shirk, Darul kufr, the lands of unbelief, then it is obligatory in the most correct saying of the scholars to make hijrah from that land to a Muslim land. And the obligation is not removed just because the land has you know, huge amounts of Muslims. You know, some people say, well, if you, look in, if you look at India, India has more Muslims than even Pakistan. And that is because of the huge population, overall population of a land such as India. So with the large numbers of Muslims that are present, then it is correct to say that Hijrah is not going to be easy. And it is not going to be something that is practical for everyone because of the huge numbers of Muslims that are present. But as for the fact that Hijrah should be done, then that remains. Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he stated in Salatul Usul wa Adillatuha that migration or Hijrah is to move from the land of polytheism. And India is a land of polytheism, Darul Shirk. Pakistan is a land of Muslims. Does that mean that every single Muslim in Pakistan is perfect and upon, you know, Tawheed and following the Sunnah? Of course not. And, you know, that's not really found in many lands of the world today. Most of the lands that they have something of bid'ah or misguidance or something in their populations. But nevertheless, this does not remove those lands from being lands of Islam. So, uh, Turkey is a land of Islam, of land of Muslims. Egypt is Darul Islam, it is a land of Muslims. The Mamlaka, meaning Saudi Arabia, it is a land of Tawheed and Sunnah and Salafiyyah, by and large. Because those people are, you know, they don't commit, you know, some of the deviations that are found in many other lands. So you don't find grave worshippers and so on, in generality, in the land of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Likewise, many of the other lands are considered from the lands of the Muslims, like Morocco is a land of the Muslims, land of Darul Islam. Likewise, Algeria, Darul Islam, it is a land of Muslims, it is a land of Islam. As for India, then India is a land of shirk and kufr. It is a land where idolatry is rampant. And that is where the Muslims, the Muslims are living amongst them. So Hijra, Shaykh Islam, he said, is to move from the land of polytheism to the land of Islam. Migration from the land of polytheism to the land of Islam is an obligation upon this ummah. And it remains as such until the hour is established. That is the statement of Shaykh al-Islam. Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab in Salatul Usul. And this is, how, this is what I hold to be correct. And then he mentions his proof with regard to that, which are several in number. From them is the ayat in Surah Al-Nisa from 97 to 99. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Alladina Tawafa Umul Malai Katu Zalimi and Fusihim Kalu Fima Kunt Fima Kuntu Kalu Kunna Mustad Mustad Afina Fil Arb Kalu Alam Takun Ardullahi Wasia Fatuha Jiru Fiha Faulaika Mawahu Jahannam Wasa at Masira. Verily, as for those whom the angels take in death. While they are wronging themselves, the angels say to them, In what condition were you? They reply, We were weak and oppressed on the earth. Then the angels say, Was not the, was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to emigrate therein? To make hijrah therein? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the ard wasi'a. Allah has made the ard wasi'a. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this throughout the Quran. Inna ardi wasi'atun. Indeed, my, my earth is spacious. So worship me. Meaning, in that earth, worship me. Imam al baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala said that the reason behind the revelation of this, of this verse was because of the Muslims who were in Mecca. And yet they did not migrate. So Allah addressed them 
with this title of Iman, meaning that Allah described them with Iman. Ya ibadi alladina amanu inna ardi wasi'a. O oh, my servants who believe, certainly spacious is my earth, so worship me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the believers because they were Muslims in Mecca and they did not migrate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called upon them. And likewise the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said that hijrah will not end until repentance comes to an end. And repentance will not end until the sun rises from the west. The hadith collected by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Abu Dawud in his Sunan, from Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullahu ta'ala declared the hadith to be authentic. So this is a proof, an ample proof in reality barakallahu feekum that even if you live in India then you should leave and go to a Muslim land. If you cannot then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed those people where Allah has said except for the weak ones among men, women and children who cannot devise a plan nor are they able to direct their own way. For these there is hope that Allah will forgive them and Allah is the of pardoning and of forgiving. So as for those who are genuinely weak and they cannot, they have no ability, they cannot devise a plan, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is afuun ghafoor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the of forgive of pardoning and the of forgiving. But as for those of you who have the ability in India or in other places where it is considered to be Darul Kufr, whether it be in Europe or the US or anywhere else where you know that as a Muslim that this land is a land of kufr. The majority of the people, rather you are maybe just a small island of Muslims in, a, in an ocean of unbelievers, whether it be secular law, Hindu law or other than that. So I advise you, wherever you may be, that if you are, li that if you are living in a land of idolatry, a land of shirk and kufr, then devise a plan and work to leave that land. As for whether Muslims of, of India can come into Pakistan, then that is not something that I am aware of in terms of you know, the, the means and the, you know, the, 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 legalities. You know, the legalities of that, uh, then I do not know. You know, I don't know. Maybe it is possible, maybe it is not possible. But that is something that you can do. But Pakistan is not the only land. You know, there is Malaysia, there is Indonesia. They are the lands of uh, North, Af North Africa, whether it be Algeria or Morocco or Tunisia or Egypt. You know, all of these. You know, all of these, barakallahu feekum. And wherever the Muslims are living under oppression and difficulty, and they are ruled by the unbelievers, and their land is a land of shirk, then it is upon them to find a way out. It is upon them to find a way out. Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, that he used to advise Likewise, the Palestinians, when the, when the state of the Jews overpowered many of the lands of the, of, the, of the Muslims where the Palestinians were living, and they said, we are under them now. He said, make hijrah and strengthen yourselves. You know, establish the deen, tasfiyah wa tarbiyah. Purify your religion from shirk and, and bid'ah and anything that violates the religion and correct your Iman, and correct your understanding, and correct your Aqeedah, and correct your Tawheed. And then cultivate your generations upon that, and that which you have lost will come back to you. That which you have lost will come back to you, because this is the manhaj of Tasfiya wa Tarbiya. People say, well how can we leave? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left Mecca. Is there any land better than Mecca in the Ard of Allah? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself stood and he, and he addressed Mecca. And he said, you are the best of the, of the land and the best of the cities in the, in the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are the best of the lands of Allah in the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And had your people not turned me out, I would never have left. Yet the Prophet wasallam left because of the oppression. Because they were harming him. Uthman radiallahu anhu left when he migrated to Abyssinia. Ja'far left and he migrated to Abyssinia. They migrated in the first migration from the land of, of idolatry to the land of Ahlul Kitab. Because Najashi was a Christian. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, migrate to a land, a land of, of, of Abyssinia because they have over them a king who does not wrong the people. He doesn't oppress the people. So they migrated. Um Salama, who later became a wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she migrated also. And when she came back, and she came to Medina and her husband passed away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her. Because she'd become a widow and the Prophet sallallahu married her. And she described some of the churches that she, that she saw in Abyssinia. So that was the first migration. Because there was no land of Islam to migrate to. There was either Mecca, where the Muslims are being oppressed, and they were being tortured, and they were being beaten and boycotted. So there was no Muslim land to migrate to. So the closest land they found where Islam could flourish and they could practice their religion was the land of Najashi, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Then when Medina became established, then migration to Medina became obligatory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to leave Mecca and migrate to Medina because Medina was the, was the land of Islam and the, and, and the land of the Muslims, the Dawla Islamiyah. They didn't say, well, how can we leave the Kaaba? The house that Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son built, Ismail. How can we leave that land and migrate to Medina? How can we leave the, the place of Hajj where the, where the Anbiya and the Rusul make Hajj? How can we leave the Ard of Allah that Allah loves, meaning Mecca, where, you know, in Masjid al-Khayf alone, 70 of the Prophets made, you know, made Salah there during Hajj. We're going to leave that. Musa alayhi salam traveled and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, it is as if I can hear him calling out with the Talbiya as he comes down into the, through the mountain passes of Mecca. That is the land that the Prophet wasallam left. Yet he went to Medina, because that is the land of the Muslims. So he migrated, and then after that, everyone else was commanded to migrate to the land of Medina. And the people, you know, and what we're finding today is that many of the people, they want to leave the lands of Islam and go and live with the Kuffar. You know, you see them paying thousands of money to, to traffickers, to smugglers, so they can, you know, they'll pay them $20,000, $30,000 to take them out of Pakistan to go and live in on the dirty streets of London. For what? Why would they want to do that? Why do you want to leave a land of Islam and go to the land where Islam is not respected and the religion is not respected and the laws do not respect the, the rights of the Muslims? in those lands, whether it be France or whether it be Holland. A woman can't even go and walk on the beach in a hijab. She's banned. So she wants to now see how the ocean is and how the seas are of France. If you're wearing a hijab, you're not allowed on the beach. This is the land that they want to migrate to. They, don't want, they want to leave the lands of Islam to go and live, with, or live amongst the kuffar. And that's how they treat them. In many of those lands, a woman can't even wear niqab. And now they're bringing in laws that would stop the Muslims from making dhabh and eating halal meat. You can't make the slaughtering of halal meat in some of those countries like Denmark and so on. How is that possible? The education system works against Islam. So now, you know, that, that you find that when the month of Ramadan comes, that all of the schools are fully functioning and the days are long. So what do the, what do the schools advise them? Don't fast. Why? Because your GCSEs are more important than fasting and they don't fast. This is the land where we want to go and you want to pay 30,000 pounds and, and sit in a container, you know, suffocate to death as many of them do. Hundreds and hundreds of them every year suffocate to death in containers on ships and lorries. All of that money you paid, for what? The lands of Islam, many of them are poorer. That is true. But the religion is not about wealth, meaning possessions. Richness is not by having huge amounts of possessions and belongings. But in reality, richness 
is the richness of the soul. So if you, my brothers and sisters, wherever you live in the lands of the non-Muslims, can migrate and you can devise a plan. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in his book from those ayat that I mentioned from Surah An-Nisa, if you can devise a plan, because the ard of Allah is wasi'ah, work and think to yourselves, sit with your families, and devise a plan to move to the Muslim countries. Alhamdulillah from the UK, and from America, and from Canada, and from other places, but especially in the UK, a lot of our Somali brothers have returned back to Somaliland. And they are flourishing, alhamdulillah. And that's not even a fully functioning nation. But yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the path for them, and they're living and flourishing with their families. Because that is better for them than raising their children in a, in a society that, you know, that will corrupt the minds and the beliefs of their children. And many of our uh, friends in the UK are traveling to Morocco and returning back to Morocco because we have a sizable Moroccan community. And even more from France that are returning back to Algeria and Morocco. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up a, a route for them. And now we're finding more and more of those who, have, who come, from the, from, come from Pakistan and their parents came over to the United Kingdom in the 19, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s that they're coming back to Pakistan because they realize that there's no future over there for their families. Generationally speaking, there is no future. Because as the generations go on, your children lose their religious heritage and their cultural heritage. You know, they, they, they don't know their language, they don't know their culture, their religion is being stripped away from them. They don't hear the Adhan. You know, from Friday to Friday, they don't hear the Adhan. Imagine living in, a, living in a community, even if it is a Muslim community in the United Kingdom, that your child never hears the Adhan. Why? Because on Jum'ah, he's at school. I mean, is that even you know, conceivable in the minds of a Muslim, that from the ages of you know, six or seven, right up until the age of 16, they never hear the Adhan? It's unusual. So when they go to Umrah or something like this and they hear the Adhan, they're like, what's that? Because they don't hear it on a regular basis. If they catch a Jum'ah in a holidays, you know, in the summer holidays, because, you know, dad drives them along to the, to the masjid, and they hear the Adhan on Yom Jum'ah, that's a rare occasion. And that's just the Adhan. Da'wah is even harder in those countries, because of the issues of Al-Wala wal bara allegiance and disavowal. You know, more and more restrictive laws that you can't speak with the truthfulness of your religion in those lands. So as the years go on, these secular societies will put more and more pressure. They are not liberal and free. They are liberal in, in terms of sexuality. They are liberal in terms of, you know, this, this uh, in, in all of their depravities. Yes, in those you know, in those matters, they are liberal. Drink and drugs and sex and music and, you know, all types of, you know, uh, trying to get richer than everybody else. In that sense, they are liberal. But they are not liberal towards, and they are not tolerant towards religious people. Because when we want to give da'wah, then it's not easy to give da'wah anymore. You want your children to have a certain type of education, a certain type of religious upbringing, it's not easy. So Hijra from India, indeed from any country, then I take the position, which is the position of Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, which is the position of Shaykh al-Albani, which is the position of a group of the scholars, the likes of Ahmed al-Najmi as I recall, Shaykh Muqbil as I recall, and others, that a person, that he strives his utmost to leave the lands of the kuffar, to move to the lands of the Muslims. If they cannot do that, then make a, a, a movement with your family to a part of your country where the Salafi da'wah is strong. Where the Salafi, so for example in the UK, you would move to Birmingham, or you'd move to Manchester, or one of these, one of these cities where the Salafi da'wah is stronger or East London or somewhere like that, where there is a masjid for the, for the people of Sunnah and Salafiyyah. Likewise, 
you would do the same in America. You would move to, you know, somewhere like Philadelphia, where the where the Salafi Dawah is stronger. So whilst you are devising a plan to move yourself and your families to a better environment, to a better country, that in the meantime you can internally move from one city to a city where there are more Salafis and your children have greater access to the knowledge of Da'wah to Salafiya. Barakallahu feekum. Shaykh, as you were giving the answer, there's a few questions related oh. to what you've said I've poured in. Okay. Uh, one is by a brother, he says, what about a person migrating from Kuwait to a place like Kashmir, which is part of India, so he's speaking about the Indian-occupied Kashmir, but originally is occupied by majority of Muslims. And the reason uh, for that is to cater to the needs of his parents who who are growing old and they need care. The issue of uh, places such as Kashmir, which is of course occupied at the moment by uh, the Indians, or the Indian authorities and the Indian army, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them freedom and liberation so that it returns to being a land of Islam because that's what the majority of the population is. And as to what to do with those kind of lands that are occupied, because these are occupied territories, then that affair must be returned back to the major scholars for judgment. As for the brother moving from Kuwait to look after his sick and suffering parents who are in uh, occupied Kashmir, then I would suggest that he goes and takes care of them. If there is no way for them to take care of themselves, do not leave your parents to suffer. And Alhamdulillah, a, a land such as occupied Kashmir is majority Muslim. Yes, there is oppression. Yes, there is suffering. Yes, there are curfews. Yes, those uh, the, the Indian authorities, that they make their lives very difficult for them. But nevertheless, your parents are there. And on a day-to-day basis, inshallah, you can attend the masajid. On a day-to-day basis, you will see 90%. You will see Muslims. And you will hear the adhan, even in occupied you know, uh, Kashmir. You will hear that. So, and on top of that, I mean, if, if it was a choice of either Kuwait or Kashmir, meaning occupied Kashmir, then of course you would stay in Kuwait. But what is driving you back to occupied Kashmir is the fact that your parents are there. And the fact that actually, even if you live in occupied Kashmir, that the majority of the people around you are Muslims. And the masajid, you know, you'll hear the adhan five times a day, your neighbors are Muslim, the guy across the road is a Muslim, the shopkeepers are Muslim, you're walking down the streets, it's all Muslims. But it just so happens that your land is occupied, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate it. Sheikh, similar brothers, uh, especially from India or the occupied Kashmir, uh, you know, who've moved specifically in the Gulf states, sometimes with uh, the scenario uh, becoming worse, you know, day by day and year, year by year in India, as you know, uh, there's a question that, that comes to their mind, uh, what you explained of uh, some of the early Sahaba maybe making the immigration or the migration to Abyssinia, which was a land uh, of shirk, basically, yeah. uh, but where they could uh, practice their religion openly. Yeah. So some of them, uh, they say, so for example, some of us who live in uh, the Gulf countries, th- this is on a temporary basis. Yeah. You know, we, do not, uh, we are not naturalized, we do not get the c- citizenship, so the, f- the fear looms overhead that they would have to go back if they don't have back job or the back to India. Yeah. We don't have a job or we lose our job or for whatever reason. So the question some of them ask, um, and, and then most of the Muslim countries, like even Turkey or Malaysia, it isn't very easy to get naturalized or earn the citizenship. Yeah. So the question some of them ask is, uh, would it be permissible in their case, where the oppression has become rampant in India, uh, would it be permissible for them to move to other non-Muslim countries where uh, the Muslims are better treated, like uh, Canada, Mm. or what have you, Australia, wherever, uh, where they wouldn't be as oppressed as they are in India. Mm. As for uh, leaving a country like India and moving to a uh, 
another non-Muslim country that is less oppressive, then the actual physical travel to a less harmful country and a less oppressive country is not a problem in essence. Why? Because you are leaving from one Darul Kufr to another Darul Kufr. Except that the secondary Darul Kufr may actually treat you better in the sense that they won't burn your house down like happens in India and they won't drag you into the street and beat you to death because this happens in India. You know, uh, because it is, a, it is oppressive towards the Muslims. Not everywhere, I'm not saying it's, a, it's something that happens in the tens and thousands or millions, no. But it is conceivable. You know, the fear is there and it's constant in, in India, in, in many parts of India that that may happen due to the oppression of the, of, uh, of the, of the idolaters there, of the, of the native population, of the Indian population. Of course, the Muslims are native also. So maybe the word native doesn't apply here, but because the Muslims are native also. But the fact that, you know, the oppression is there. So the actual moving is not the issue. The issue is taking nationality. Taking citizenship in a non-Muslim country involves giving bay'ah. This is where the difficulty arises. So moving from one land of kufr to another land of kufr is, is of course allowable. You know, for, a, for and especially if there's a need like the need we've mentioned. The issue is when you move to Canada, you have to give the Pledge of Allegiance. You move to the UK, you have to give the Pledge of Allegiance. This bay'ah to, uh, to a non-Muslim ruler or the crown, as it is in the UK, to the monarch, is something that is haram, by consensus of the scholars. It is not permissible to give the bay'ah, the pledge of allegiance, to a kafir, to an unbeliever. And that is a must, if you're taking citizenship in those countries, whether it be, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand uh, the UK, all of the European countries, you're going to have, and the US also, you're going to have to give the Pledge of Allegiance in one form or another to the crown or to the leader or to the government or to the flag. You know, these are, these are, 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 are without doubt affairs that a person must consider. And you can't do that. As for if you get a job, you know, would I rather live in India where, you know, there's difficulty and there's oppression and you know, and, and or should I move to Canada for a short period of time? You know, of course, Canada is better for Indians, Indian Muslims. But you cannot take citizenship there, which actually puts you back into the situation of the Gulf countries. So it is better that you stay in the Gulf countries for as long as you can, whether it be the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, of course, being the best of all of them, Darul Tawheed, and the rest of the Gulf countries, such as Kuwait, Oman even, Egypt, which is of course, uh, it's not a Gulf country, but it is a Middle Eastern country. Places like Egypt, Jordan, all of them are good. They're better than India by far. If you can get to Pakistan, excellent, alhamdulillah. So the moving to those countries, even if it be on short-term contracts, a year at a time, two years at a time, three years at a time, and just extend it for as long as you can. In that period of time, work, because now you're a person who is in the Gulf country, in from that Gulf country, maybe you can get Turkish citizenship. Maybe you can get Egyptian citizenship. Maybe you can get Malaysian citizenship. Because all of these are Muslim countries. Some are better than others, of course. And uh, some are more ideal than others. But even, you know, if you can move to, why not, Somalia, Somaliland. Muslim country. You know, and there are many other Muslim countries that you can move to. Of course, some are more difficult than others because some of them are in utter poverty. So if you take your wife and your children there, you're going to starve. And the, and the religion does not command you to kill yourselves. Do not kill your own selves, for indeed Allah has been with you most merciful. So don't put yourselves in the path of destruction as you're devising a plan. That's why those who are weak in the land and they are weak from the women and from the children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons them. Maybe Allah will forgive them and pardon them just as Allah has mentioned. But if they are living in the Gulf country, stay there as long as you can. And whilst you are there, you know that you have the ability to research and look around, look for countries in North Africa, look to, and, and in reality to move, those, to move to those countries, 
you're going to have to be some sort of trader or have some sort of skill or some sort of you know good qualifications and whilst you are in the Gulf countries you can actually gather those together you can get certifications you can save your wealth you can buy, buy property in Muslim countries such as Egypt you can buy property in Turkey you can buy property in Morocco you work your way around even if you have to marry one of them marry them if you're a single brother marry an Egyptian sister you know, if you're a single brother, marry a Turkish sister. You know, use the halal means. And marry a person who has a nationality of a Muslim country. And that will open a door for you. And likewise, your daughters. If you have, in India, you know, if you've got daughters and you want good for your daughters and you want to make it easy for them, let them marry someone, a Moroccan brother, Egyptian brother. Of course, do your research. Don't just throw your daughters out there. You don't want to end up in a mess. But you know, do your research, marry a person who is Salafi. It doesn't matter if she's a first wife, second wife, third wife. As long as the man can look after her and provide for her. And he has the means, the financial means, and he has the ability. You know, this is, all of this is good. There are many, many different avenues. It's not just one path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up avenues because the ard of Allah is wasi'ah. But I wouldn't. But you can't anyway. It is not allowed to take citizenship in a Catholic country. If you want to go and save yourselves from harm and stay there as a refugee or as a you know as a worker or as a qualified worker, many of those countries you have to have skills anyway. So from the Gulf countries, you possibly can move to Canada for a period of time. As for getting citizenship in Canada or in or in the UK, then you can't do that because bay'a to the non-Muslims is not allowed. الله تعالى عالم بارك الله فيكم so upon that inshallah we'll finish for today wa subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdika shahadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka